Amen. If you believe that, say amen again. Amen. It's good to see you this morning. How many of y'all suffering with allergy crud? Join the club. They always have one of these little mints. This one's probably about four years old. I've never eaten it, but today I am. <laughs> Knock that green stuff off of it. It's okay. All right. Good to see you today. Praise the Lord. What a great day. You know, it's good to come together on Sunday morning, worship the Lord together. We're in a series called Ministry Matters. Uh, We just finished our series a few weeks ago, Money Matters. But Sunday we started this particular study on Ministry Matters. We we dealt with last week uh, realizing that ultimately if you do confess to be a Christian and you really mean that, it's in your heart and life, it's not just a terminology, then you have a responsibility. You have a ministry. The Bible says that we're new creations in Christ. Old things pass away. All things become new. And part of that all things, folks, is that God changes you. And as he changes you, he makes you this this new person. But with this new person comes this new life and these new actions and these new attitudes. In fact, let me say this. What we do as Christians should not be pretense and it should not be playing at it or acting like it. It's something that ought to flow from an understanding of, of who we are, what our identity is. And I think probably one of the great sins in the church today is the pastors haven't done a very good job of teaching people who they are. They've been pretty good telling them what you ought to do, here's what you ought to do, here's what you ought to do. But you need to understand who you are. And once you really get a grip on who you are and what God did for you and did with you when you gave your heart to him, that'll change what you do. And things will begin to flow on more of a natural feel for you and a natural flow. So you're discovering that if the Lord really did make me a minister and gave me gifts and capabilities and talents, these supernatural things in my life, then I can operate in those because that's, that's who I am. And when we understand who we am, I, I know we're living in a confused world when it comes to identity and gender and everything else. But hey, if, if you're a Christian, you don't get this down. You're going to be living in bondage most of your spiritual life. I always try to tell people who are facing spiritual struggles and bad habits and strongholds in their life, once you really begin to get a grip on who you are, that begins to change that effect of those things in your life because you realize that God's done this deep supernatural change in me. I'm not subject to the things that I used to be subject to, nor do I have to bow to those things and become enslaved by those things because I'm redeemed. I'm set free. The truth sets you free. So as we talk about in this series, Ministry Matters, let's understand that who we are is important because it then begins to affect what we do, all right? So if we get into part two, I want to talk about two things specifically today. Uh, The ministry that God's called us to, all of us, if we're believers, and the minister, you know, who I am, what God's done in me, and how that should result in a change of what I do. I really believe that when we, we get a grip on who we are, Uh, then we won't live like spiritual paupers in our life. We'll live more like the spiritual kings and princes and prince that God's called us to live in our life. So in 1 Peter 2, now I love 1 Peter. I preached this whole book, I guess, over about a a 30-week period several years ago. But there's a couple of verses I want to hone in on in in chapter 1 and a little bit in chapter 2 today. We'll see how how much of this we get through. But if you look in the last part of chapter 1, First part, he's telling him you've been redeemed, you've been saved, God's touched your life, God's son is the, is the way you met the Lord, your life's different now. And he says, aren't you been forgiven of your sins? And he says in verse 22, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from your heart. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and abiding word of God. You know, in Matthew, Jesus referred to the word of God as seed that's sown into people's hearts. And when it takes, when it's, then when, it's, when it's received there, it changes the person's life. They begin to have a fruitful, meaningful life. It says, you've been born again, not a seed which is perishable and imperishable. It's through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass. In other words, our, our seed, you know, you may have a child, but we're all going to perish in our own fleshly way. It's glorious like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall off. But he goes on to say this other seed, this word of God, it abides forever. And this is the word which we preach to you. This is, this is the seed that you've received is the word of God. And then he goes into verse, the chapter one, he says, therefore, since you've been born of this seed and since you're a new person, therefore, 
put aside all malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. When we're talking about ministry matters, we talk about this in the context of you as a minister and the ministries you're supposed to have. It really goes back to what this, this passage is teaching. It's understanding that you, you've, had a, you've had a life-changing experience, whether you realize it or not. Whether it felt cataclysmic or not, it was cataclysmic. Whether it felt you know, like the mountains exploded or whatever. Uh, in, in the sense of your emotions, it's not important that you experience it. But in the sense of your understanding and receiving truth and what God says about you, that's vitally important. All right, You need to get a grip on who you are. And when you get a grip on who you are, when you gave your life to Christ, if that happened, you're not going to be content nor satisfied, nor are you going to be successful in any way, in an internal way, in the life you're living apart from Christ. Because when you discover who you really are in Jesus, it begins to affect every part of your being and every part of your life and every part of all the relationships you live in. And that's what he's saying here. If you've been affected by the word of God, it's going to change some things in your life. He said, because you've been born anew, not of this old corrupt seed, but you've been born of the word of God. And when you get a grip on this, here's what's going to happen. And again, I really believe that our biggest failure has been pastors not teaching people who they really are in Christ. Not really getting a grip on what God's done in your life when you really gave your heart and life to him. That something took place within you. You say, well, I'm not experiencing it. Because you're choosing to live an old life. You're choosing to live in an old fashion. You're choosing to live in by the old habits, the old life ways. And you're not that person anymore. So as long as you try to pursue that, you're not going to be satisfied. You're not going to find the fullness that God has for you in your life. So the best thing to do is find out what the Bible does say about you. Who am I? And begin to really understand that. And I don't believe it's something you have to pretend. I believe that God will begin to work out through you what he's saying here in these passages of scriptures. So when you discover who you are, what you do changes. How you respond changes when you really begin. And this is something we just don't get the lights on all of a sudden. This is, is what he's saying here, this is a growing experience. And we'll see this as, as we carry this message out. But let me talk about our ministry first. You say, I'm not a minister. Yes, you are. All right, the Bible tells us very clearly that if we know Christ, then we've been born again. It says in you know, 2 Corinthians that we're a new creation. It also says there that you've been given a ministry of restoring other people to Christ and bringing people to God. And Jesus made clear reference many, many times that if you follow him, your life's going to be changed. He said, you'll be, you'll be the light of the world. You'll be the salt of the earth. Light, salt, ministers. All these things are, are people and identifying people who make a difference in the world that they live in. You know, they're just not little neutral beings. Well, my life didn't impact anybody and I'm not impacted by anybody. You just miss it. And your life is so self-centered and so egocentric when it needs to be turned into kind of a deocentric, Jesus-centered, God-centered thing. And then it begins to affect everything that goes on in your life. He, he gives us a little bit of insight into the ministry that we have in those, back, excuse me, back, go back to those two verses. One of them is back to the back. He gives us a little insight in these verses. He said, you also as living stones are being built up Calls you a living stone. He says you're being built in a spiritual house. Catch this. For a holy priesthood. And as a priesthood, he says, you offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then he gives you another identity, Tyler. You are a chosen race. You are, catch this, a royal priesthood. Another term, a holy nation. A people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he tells you who you are, and then he gives you a little insight to what you do. What do you do? Well, I've underlined it. One of those verses up there, it says that, you know, <clears throat> right here, he said, uh, you're offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You offer up any spiritual sacrifices today? How about this week? Did you offer up any spiritual sacrifices? When does that happen? It happens when you realize you're a priest. All right? You're a holy priest unto God. You say, well, you know, do I have to turn my collar around or wear a robe or anything like that? No. Here's the thing about it is that you have, in the Old Testament, if you look at priests in the Old Testament, there, there are several things that made a, them a priest. One was that they were called by God. You've been called by God to fulfill this role. But a priest in the Old Testament, one, he, he, he had direct access to God. 
Now, there was a time when men did not have direct access to God. They had to, had to relate everything through the priest, a mediator, to the high priest, and then to God. But Jesus is our high priest, and he's made everybody who comes to him his priest, all right? Which means that you're, you're a priest unto the Lord. You know, now don't go around telling anybody to call you father or something, all right? Just don't get out far with it. But you are, a, you are a representative. You have direct access to God. Now, this is a misunderstood concept in the New Testament because there are millions of people who believe that they need another human mediator to get to God. You do not, according to what the Bible teaches, you, have, you, go, you, you go to God yourself. The only person you have to go through is Jesus. So when you come to a right relationship with Christ, you have access to God. You can talk to God. You can ask God for stuff. You can present your burdens to God. You have a relationship with God now. He opens his mind, his heart, his ears, his love to you. He receives you. He doesn't say, you've got to do this, but you've got to become... No, he has made you acceptable. He said, what did he say? We've been purified, right? We've been washed, we've been made clean, and been made into priests as a result of that. It's good to know. I don't have to, you know, go to church on Sunday to get to God. I can go to church. I can just go to God right now. I can go to God at church, in church. I, I can go to God at house. I can go to God in the bathroom if I need to. All right? I can go to God any time. I have access to God. Why? Because he's made me one of his priests. They also, the priest also represented the people to God. On behalf of the people, they'd go to God. Presenting sacrifices on behalf of the people. Well, we still hold that kind of priestly role, but our, our responsibility is a little different now. We're not offering sacrifices for them. They've already had the, the offer made. Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, but we're the ones who tell them. Sacrifices have been made on your behalf. You can be, you've been made acceptable to God if you, all you, live, if you choose this, this gift of grace by, by faith. You choose on your own behalf. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to coach... Bible verses for it. You don't have to go through some liturgical order of, uh, and, and amendments to be memorized and catechisms. No, you just, you come to Christ in faith. You say, Lord, I repent of my sins coming into my life and forgive me. And I choose to follow you. It, 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 it's not even the saying of it. It's in the surrender of your heart for where the heart of man believes unto righteousness. Now we confess it with our mouth, but it starts here in the heart. This moment that, that, that we all have this responsibility now to, to represent you know, uh, the people to God and to pray for the lost. And the, the Bible says we should pray for kings and authority because all these people ought to be praying for. Why? Because God has us here on the earth representing the world around us. But also, it says that the priest in the Old Testament, another thing the priest would do is that they would bring offerings on behalf, you know, of the people to God for themselves and for the people. Offerings we made, sacrifice we made. Well, we know the sacrifice has been made, all right? But we present now a different kind of offering. And the Bible tells us in many places, if we just study it carefully, what many of those offerings are. Let's make it as simple as possible. The Bible says we bring the sacrifice of praise. That's one of the offerings we bring. We bring the sacrifice of praise. Uh, the Bible says we present the calves of our lips as an offering to the Lord. Words, we use our mouth to honor the Lord. We use our mouth to praise the Lord. We use our mouth to bring blessings to God. We use our mouth to honor God. Amen and bless that. <laughs> you get a record at four. So what am I doing? I'm praising the Lord. I mean, seriously, let's just, let's just forget anybody's in the room but you and me. How often do you praise the Lord? Do you even praise the Lord? You know? How often is, is that a part of your life? How about when we come into the Lord's house with his other priest and we're all here to present a living sacrifice unto the Lord and we're all here to offer our acceptable sacrifice. How many worship the Lord at this moment in time? I mean, well, that's not an important part. I'm just going to go outside and fellowship. No, you're, you should be in here worshiping God. You say, what right do you have to tell me that? I'm your pastor. That's my job. <laughs> God gave you, me, I know he has a sense of humor. <laughs> Amen. But here you are. We ought to be worshiping, and, and we ought not just be sitting there with our hands in the pocket looking at the wall, reading the words off the wall. We ought to end with a heart of worship and a heart of praise. Why? Because we are priests unto the Lord. This is who we are. And if it's who we are, hey, priests worship the Lord. Priests honor the Lord. We sing to the Lord. The Bible says, bring, let's bring the sacrifice of praise to the Lord. And over and over again, it talks about worshiping the Lord and honoring the Lord with our lips and by blessing the Lord and speaking words of praise and speaking words of blessing to the Lord. This is part of our spiritual sacrifice. But that's just a small part 
What we do as ministers for the Lord, our witness, our work, our relationship and our family, all these are acts of worship. How I respond to my wife and, 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 and honor her as a woman in, in, in our marriage relationship, that's worship. How she would honor me as her husband, that, that's an act of worship as we do it unto the Lord. So our lives become this living thing of being priests of the Lord. Wherever we are, catch this. Don't, don't, don't let this go. As a priest, I am representing someone who? I'm representing the Lord. All right, I'm representing God, his kingdom, this living temple. I'm representing him. This is what I am and it is what I do. So wherever we are, whatever we do, we're bringing these. In ministry, when, when you're serving the Lord in some capacity, and many of you serve the Lord in Believer's Fellowship, and an incredible amount of you are involved in ministries, that's worship, and you're offering spiritual sacrifices with what you do for the Lord. I mean, even if it's changing a dirty diaper in the nursery, you say, that, that's a definitely a, an aroma <laughs> and a fragrance to the Lord. Hey. It's, it's a blessed aroma in his side because you're doing it for his glory. He says, you are offering up spiritual sacrifices. Your faith, the obedience in your heart and life, when you choose to obey the Lord, that act of faith is spiritual service and worship to the Lord. But that's what you're called to do. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's why when you're responding that way and living and walking in the spirit like that, there's a, there's a satisfaction. So when we move out of that, we start making it about ourselves, we get dissatisfied. We turn more egocentric and inward than we do deocentric and upward. Then obviously we're, we're what's, you know, this thing ain't working for me. This thing ain't working for me. I don't, I, there's no blessing here. There's no, there's no, because you're not being who God called you to be. You've moved out of the range. He says also, you, you proclaim the excellency of him who called you. What do priests do? They declare just how good God is. They declare how great God is. We just sang the song, how great they are. That, that's what he's talking about here. We're proclaiming. We proclaim it through song. We proclaim it through testimony. We proclaim it through Bible studies. But we also just proclaim it with our witness. We let the world know God is good. Here's the way David the psalmist put it. To everyone. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. What's he saying? What do you magnify something? Kathy's asking me to help her put one of those little screws back in her little glasses thing last night. I said, well, you better find the magnifying glass. And I'm so old and blind, I can't see those little screws anymore. And so I'm having her hold the magnifying glass. And, you know, don't, be, don't get in the shade. Don't, make, don't create a shadow. Get over it, you know. And I'm sitting there fumbling around. I wouldn't have made it with that magnification. What's it doing? It's just make everything look bigger. All right, makes it a, 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 now we don't have any problem magnifying our distress all too often, amen? Magnifying our problems. But what we ought to do is magnify the Lord. And as we magnify him, basically make him, and you clearly can't make him look any bigger than he is. We can just make him look bigger in people's eyes. He's already magnified, all right? He's God. But as priests, what do we do? We make God look big. We talk about his greatness, we talk about his goodness. Here's where we fail in this, in, in, in church sometimes, because we've been told what we should do. All right? We should be a witness. So we think, well, I'll be a witness, so I better stick some tracks in my pocket or you know, some invitations to the church or something so I can be a witness. Well, it's good to go witnessing, but reality, the Bible says, God has made you a witness. So that wherever I am, it's not something I go do, it's just something I are. I just talk about Jesus. I just magnify the Lord. But don't you think somebody that might embarrass somebody? I don't care. I care about them more than I care about their feelings. I care about their soul. I care about their life. And so I, I just, well, don't you think that, you know, people might not like you? Y'all know how much I care about that, right? <laughs> I want to be liked, but I don't want to be more liked more than I want Jesus to be glorified or his truth to be magnified or his name to be honored. We're more concerned with that and because we're preached unto the Lord. So what am I? I'm a priest. What are you? Turn to the person beside you. I'm a priest. No, don't ask him to call you father again. I'm a and, and we are, and this is not something that's outlandish or something ridiculous. The Bible says we're here and we proclaim the, the, the excellencies of Christ. We just, uh, even as we sang that song, you know, there's, a, there's another song we, we sang that, uh, this morning about, uh, uh, at, at the Magnolia campus. That, you know, we're just amazed at the wonder of the Lord. We're amazed at the grace of God. We're amazed at the greatness of God. There's another old hymn that went like this. It was a, oh, how wonderful, oh, how marvelous, and my song shall ever be. What, what's his name? God's just great. 
God's just glorious. He said, well, why is all this happening to me? Why don't you get your eyes off the me part of that? And get your eyes on God and see what he will do in the middle of your situation. See what he's capable of doing. Uh, sometimes we're not interested in what God wants to do. We're interested in what we want God to do. We want God to get me out of this problem. And God may be saying, that problem's the best thing that ever happened. You should just stay there for simmer for a while. Because right there, you're going to learn something about my presence and my grace and my glory. So what is our ministry? Our ministry is we are priests unto the Lord. We're offering up spiritual sacrifices. All we do is, an, is it should be a sweet-smelling aroma in the, in, the, in the presence of God. And we're here to proclaim out here, here we worship, over here, we're proclaiming the excellencies of his greatness and his might and his majesty and his glory. We're talking it up. Every Christian ought to be talking Jesus up in their life on their job, in their school. You do not let the world intimidate you. That's the gist of what's going on here. We do not let the world back us up, shut us down, stop us. We are the ones who are the truth bearers, and we present it. Now, if they receive it, we don't get all, you know, we, all, we, we can get all excited, but if they don't receive it, we don't get all mad. I mean, Jesus said, some are going to reject this, some are going to accept it. It's not your responsibility to get upset or disappointed when they don't. You're just to be a priest of the Lord. Just be a priest of the Lord. Now, with that, in that, that context of that ministry is the, this description of, of if we are these holy priests unto the Lord, and that's what we are to do, then he gives us a little insight in this next part of this chapter. Uh, by the way, if that's what you do, here's what you don't do. All right? This is the should not do list. Why does he list the should not do? Because apparently we do the should not do's. Amen? And we don't do the do. All right? And what we need to do is focus on the do and not the not do's. Get rid, of the, get rid of the things we shouldn't be doing and start doing the other. It's kind of like a principle of replacement. We do one or the other, right? So if you're not going to do this, and he, he lists it. And this is interesting because he talks about those first verses, how we, we, have this, we have this unfeigned love for the brethren, this sincere love for each other. Out of a pure heart, we love one another. Why? Because that's the way God loves you. And he starts that chapter one like that. Now, he says, you love others with the same way. Now, I can't love others if I miss this, this instruction. He says in verse one, therefore, put aside all malice and guile, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. There's five things there. Five things. One, he says, is the first one. Put this off. Get, get rid of malice. Get rid of malice. Get, get rid of it. Now, when he says get rid of it, by the way, that means get rid of it. How many of you ever had somebody tell you, uh, man, there's a, there's a bumblebee on your shoulder. You don't sit there and sing songs to it. Oh, listen to him. He's buzzing. I think he may sting me. This is great. That's the idea. It's cast off. Throw it off. Get, don't, there's no room for malice. And the best description I could find of this in every Greek to English dictionary was this congealed anger. In other words, we have an unforgiving spirit. Somebody has offended me. Instead of responding the right way, in the relationship, I just let it simmer. And sometimes, I, oh, I'm going to forgive them, but I let it simmer. How do I know I let it simmer? Because then they offend me twice, I'll bring it up. Let me give you a lesson that will change your life. Y'all ready for this one? Don't forget this. Write this down. Somebody's going to offend you for the day's over. <laughs> might be me. <laughs> it, might be it might be your wife. It might be your husband. It might be your kids. It might be your dad. So it might be a church member. Some, somebody's going to offend you for the days over, right? It's just going to happen. That's the, that's the world we live in. And it's just, they may not even intend to offend you. I don't set out to offend people. I just, it's just a natural for me. <laughs> it's just, it just happens, you know. It, it's not intended. I, there's usually a heart of love that's intended. But it, it, it's, we offend each other. And that's why he's saying before this, you've got to have this sincere love, this unadulterated love for each other. And so, you know, don't let these things, don't let it must, malice is going to come, but don't let it settle in. You're going to be, you're going to be upset about it, but don't let it, don't let it cook, all right? You're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to be mad about something, but don't let that congeal. Don't let it, you know, it's kind of like jello, you know, it just forms into a solid mass all of a sudden. And then it's harder to get rid of. It's just, it congeals this unforgiving spirit. He said, along with that, he said, you've got to get rid of the guile. That's the word dolos, by the way. And it, when the Bible talks about the pure word of God, we'll mention that in a minute. It's about desiring the sincere miracle of the word. We'll, we'll see this word again. But dolos means deceit. It means deliberate dishonesty. That's the best description I can come up. You willingly deceive somebody. 
You're willingly dishonest about it. Have I offended you? No, you haven't offended me. Would you say, yeah, you offended me. But I'm getting over it. I love you. Yeah. But yeah, we, we, we just rather deceive one. And, and if you follow down chapter 2 to verse 23, 22, it's talking about Jesus. And it says he wasn't like this. It says he committed no sin. And it says, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. There's, there's no guile. And then he says, get rid of all hypocrisy because he's just building. Because you start letting malice enter, then guile comes, and then hypocrisy, which is that word for meaning. It's hypocrisis in the, in the Greek language, which means that to, it was a theatrical term for acting and for, for playing a role in a drama or, or theatrical uh, presentation. You had a part you played. It wasn't you, it's was a part you played. It's not what's really you. In fact, you know, in, in, in those times they used masks to do different characters and they put this mask on for that character and when time, time for the lines of the second character, they put the mask behind him and held up the other mask. He said, don't be that kind of person who wears masks. Don't be that kind of person who's dishonest. He says, I, you need to have a sincere love for the brethren. Don't let there be any play acting. And then he used this word, put away, the word is phthonos in, in the Greek language. It has to do with, with an envy, which is just ill will. It's a jealousy which creates an attitude towards somebody of, you know, you just, you, it, it's just ill will. It's used a lot of times in scripture when it talks about mostly in every one of these, it has to do with relationships with somebody else. You have an, an attitude towards them, something happened. And sometimes maybe even something didn't happen between you and that person, but something happened to some other person and they told you about it. And you're offended on their behalf now. I can't believe that, guy, that, that she said that to him or he said that to her. Or he said that to him, whatever it might be. And so we're offended on their, their behalf. And, and boy, you read Proverbs, you see how foolish that becomes, right? I says, never believe anything you hear both sides of a story because that's foolishness. So, so don't live with this kind of envy and this kind of ill will that somebody maybe has something that you don't have or something that you want or something you wanted and you didn't get. Don't let that, don't let that fest in your life. Then he uses the word evil speaking because this word all heads, Amen. When something goes on in the heart, it usually comes out the, the mouth, right? Katalele is the word here. And it can correctly be translated as defamation of character, slandering people. I've seen this happen in so many people's lives over the years of ministry that I've been in, where people just get upset with somebody, and then they begin to let this malice build and the guile, deceit. And they'll put on a good face with the person when they're around them, but they're not being sincere. They're not being honest with that person and say, I have a difficulty that we need to straighten out. You're my brother. This, you know, we need to resolve this situation. They won't do that. They'll go tell somebody else about it, you know, because it's easier to tell somebody else because you have to face the person you offend or the person that offended you. It's always easier to go some other place. But that's not what God tells you. So if your brother has all to you, you, go to your brother, right? If you have all against your brother, you go to your brother. If he has all against you, you go to your brother. So what do we do? Whether we did it or they did it, we go to our brother. And we say, hey, you know, we need to work this out. We're here. We're the people of God. We're men of God. We're women of God. We, we need to get this. But what happens is if it's not done, what's happening after that then becomes this, this defamation of character. Sin in any of these forms is always comes down to this, that which is untrue, that which is deceitful. On the other hand, God, his word, Jesus, our heavenly father, they are all the source of everything that is true and everything that is pure. You go back to Genesis where Satan is in the garden tempting Eve. And what's he doing? He's giving her little half-truths and lies. Because any half-truth is just a lie. All right? It's not the whole story. Half God said, that, oh, God wants you to miss out. You know, if you, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, you're not going to have any fun in life. Because God's trying to mess your life up. So if you're hearing those kind of stories in your mind, I want you to know where it's coming from. And on top of that, not only where it's coming, the Bible tells us very clearly that Satan's a liar and the father of all lies. So if lies are being birthed in my spirit, I need to see where they're coming from. Amen? But everything, you know, from, from the time where Adam and Eve are in the garden and Satan's tempting there, or whether he's tempting you or me, it always gets down to lies and deception and half-truths. And what's it, the only recourse for that, he says, you got to cast this off. You don't let this stuff settle on your life. It's like a dirty garment. You throw it away. You get rid of it. That's what, so here we have these things we shouldn't do. We shouldn't let these things settle on our life. So if we're going to be effective in what we are doing for the Lord, these will be the very things that will keep you from being effective. These will be the very things that will rob you of joy. These will be the very things that will rob you of your peace. These will be the very things that will rob you of the power that you need to do the ministry that God's called you to do by presenting the spiritual sacrifices, by magnifying the name of the Lord. These will be the things that will kill you. They'll hurt you. They'll influence you in terrible ways. So after he tells us what we shouldn't do, it's always good because the Lord never tells us not to do something. He doesn't tell us what to replace it with. It's that replacement principle. 
A lot of people are good at stopping stuff. They never get started, though, <laughs> on the right stuff. And he tells us what you should do. Now that you're a changed person, he says, here's what you should do. And he, he gives several things here. He said, first of all, he said, you should desire the pure or the sincere milk of the word. Now, when he talks about this word desire, it is a word which means to have a deep craving for or a longing for. You really should develop this, this appetite in your spiritual life where you have this longing for, this, this deep desire for the Word of God. When you read this letter and, the, and what Paul is, and what Peter is saying here to the church, he's making it very clear. He wants you to be hungry. He wants you to be eager to receive what it is that God has for you. He wants you to have a, this appetite for, for what God's telling you. He said, just like a baby desires the sincere milk of the Word. You don't think babies want to eat, you just listen to them scream. Y'all have had babies, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. When a baby gets hungry, if he didn't get satisfied, what's he doing? He's longing and craving. He's going to let you know he's hungry. And the Bible says for us, you know, after we cast out these impure motives and these impure, impure selfish desires, what we need to do is to, to start feeding ourselves a wholesome appetite and a, and a pure appetite that produces, he said, that you might grow thereby. The result of me getting into the Word, reading the Word, is that I would grow from the Word. What's the Word? The Word is truth. God gives us truth. What's Satan give us? Deception. He gives us lies. Pure milk, he uses that term. You should desire pure milk. I don't know if you've been to the grocery store lately. A lot of stuff have the little label pure on it, right? When it says pure, it's supposed to mean unadulterated by anything. Nothing else maxed in, nothing else added. We didn't add this to it. You know, we didn't add that to it. You know, uh, it's, it's just pure. That means, you know, you shouldn't be able to bank on it. But what we know is pure is this book. There's nothing going to be deceitful in here for you. There's nothing going to lead you to lie in here, to cheat and to steal and to be dishonest and to hate. It's just not going to lead you that path. Now, a lot of people use this book to embrace those kinds of, of paths in their life, but they just don't know the truth of God's Word. God's Word doesn't deceive, and neither should we at the same point. We want to desire and the word desire, again, is this Greek word epopothe, which means to sincerely, deeply crave for something. So if you follow this kind of steps of what, what we do since we've been changed, the first step is we, we keep repenting of anything that's not right in our life. Those things, those inward sins that destroy us. And we, we at the same time, repentance is a two-sided coin. We stop this, we start that. And what we do start is we start getting hungry for God's word. Now, if the Bible's not a part of your daily life, then you're not going to grow. This is the simple terminology here. He said the idea here is you desire the sin circle of the word that you can grow thereby. Verse 2. So what's the purpose of me reading the word of God or studying the word of God or coming and hearing the word of God? The purpose is always for my, my maturity. So that I can be more what God called me to be. And as I'm being more what God called me to be, then I'll do those things we mentioned earlier that our ministry are. But if I'm not doing those, it's most likely because somewhere down the road, you know, my growth has been stunted. The Apostle Paul used the word with Corinthians. He said, just, you, you, you are dwarfed. In other words, you're not where you should be. And he's using this in the context that the natural process of spiritual growth is not going on in your life. Why is it not going on? Because you're not eating right. You don't have a well-balanced diet of truth in your life. And you need a fully well-balanced diet of truth. There ought to be a time in your life when you're reading this word regularly and, and processing it through your life on a regular basis. Now, what he says in the verse 3, he says, you know, you should desire the sincere milk of the word of the Lord that you may grow thereby. In verse 3, he adds this, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. You know, I've never really craved anything I hadn't tasted. <laughs> Think about it, right? I love Whataburger chocolate malts. Now, I'd never had this problem if I'd never tasted it. <laughs> Can I get a witness? I crave Freddy's French fries. Used to be McDonald's, but Freddy beat him now. Somebody stuck a Freddy's over here. It was the devil. <laughs> now, I'm seeking to lose a little weight. So I'm going to start craving something else. I can't crave Freddy's, and I can't crave those water bottles, and I can't crave Bluebell Butter Crunch. That's the one with the Butterfinger in it, you know? I shouldn't have told you that, should I? 
But you know, it's like your children. You, you're trying to get them to develop an appetite for things, you know, and so you start feeding them. It's all right in the beginning to have those mashed peas and carrots and stuff. That's, by the way, have you ever tasted that? I never crave that. <laughs> but put me on some fresh food off the table, you know. That, that was a, you start craving things. You start desiring things. And as you grow, your, your, your palate grows and your appetite grows. At least it should. I mean, some of you still eat french fries when you, you ought to try a little spinach or something every once in a while, you know. Just a little something green wouldn't hurt. And that, when I say that, I mean non-fried green. You know, just, my statement for many years was, I love vegetables as long as you fry them. <laughs> yeah. Put some ranch dressing with them and we'd go down on them. But what we're desiring is something. We have tasted the word of God. We know how good. In fact, it says you, he uses tasted the kindest. I don't know why they translate that word like that. It's really a word which means delicious. You've tasted how delicious the Lord is. Man, that's good. And every one of you who have experienced Christ, even on an elementary level in your life by giving your heart to him, you know what that was like in those beginning days. That was, that was good stuff. That was delicious. Well, what happened to that? You quit eating. You quit craving. You quit tasting. And as soon as you quit tasting, guess what? Your appetite begins to change from back to those junk again. And when, when, you, when you satisfy your spiritual appetites with all the wrong things, you're going to go hungry and you're going to have the spiritual starvation experience. All right? And you're going to kind of become spiritually bulimic. And then problems set in. But Psalms 34 says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's this experience of saying, I'm eating this, I'm drinking this. Jesus said, it's, it's like my body. He says, it's like bread. Now, he's not saying to be a candle. He's saying, experience my life. Experience my life. And when you experience my life, you know how good it is when you're right with me. You know how good it is when you're walking with me. You know how good it is when you're in the word. You know how good it is. But what do we do? We embrace those five other things and just cast this off. And therefore, what happens? We don't grow. We don't grow. Now, there's three points I want to make. The first one here has to do with desiring. The second one, he tells the priest that they should be growing. And the third thing he tells the priest is that they should be worshiping. And he uses this terminology. He says, we should be coming to him in verse 4. Now, that does not describe the initial moment that each of us, if we are born again, come to Jesus and give our life and heart to him and surrender ourselves to him. That's a different kind of coming. That's not what it's talking about here. This has to do with an action of, of every priest is always coming before the Lord. Every priest has a time when they're spending time with the Lord. Every priest has a time when they're offering sacrifices, all right? When they're really in, in, in fellowship, let's just say, and, and walking with God. This is what he's talking about, not in the context of whether you just came to the altar and you prayed a prayer and you gave your life to Jesus. Hebrews 10 puts it like this. He says, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. What's his end? You got to spend time with God. And not just in your prayer closet, in your day. You got to learn what it means to be sensitive to the presence of God in your life as you go about your life. Yes, you should have a quiet time. Yes, you should have a time when you seek the Lord's face. Yes, you have a time when you're just laying your burdens out and your fellowship and you're tasting and you're seeing how good the Lord is. But in the context of your life, it's really just all about this, this I'm walking with God. We use the word in the Greek language koinonia, which our church is... Part of our name is that word. It's believer's koinonia, believer's fellowship. We fellowship with the Lord. We fellowship with each other. He, he kind of uses a figure of speech here when he talks about you're coming to him as a living stone. Who are we coming to? We're coming to Jesus. We're coming to our Father. In fact, if you read through 1 Peter, he calls him not only a living stone. He said in chapter 1, he calls him a living hope. In the latter part of chapter 1, verse 23, he calls him the living word. And now here in verse 4, chapter 2, he's our, our living stone. In other words, Jesus is not just, you know, a religious idol out here. He's alive. He, he's functioning in the world today. He's, he should be working in our hearts. He should be moving in our lives. We should be recognizing his presence. And this living stone that Jesus is, it says he, he's given us life. He has the capacity to transfer that life when we come to him. He is the rock upon which we build our life. He is the chief cornerstone of which we build the church. He says, and as we come to him, he says, we become living stones. So he transfers that life to us. So we have his life. And the more closely we are linked to him and locked in with him, the more we have experienced that life. Now look, who he gives this description. He's a living hope. He's a living word. He's the living stone. If you follow us down in verse 4, he is the choice of God. He's God's most precious one. He's God's only begotten son. In fact, the word here is eclectos, the, the called out chosen one. 
We are the ecclesi the ecclesia. We're his called out church. He's the eclectos. He's the called out one to lead that church. As we said last week, he's the head of everything we do. He's in charge of what's going on. But here we are, on the other hand, we're connected to him now. I love it how it says it here. He is the elect of God, the choice one of God, and he is precious, it says in verses 4 through 6. He is precious in God's sight. Why is he precious? Because he is God's only begotten son. He also makes it very clear. He is this living stone that the, the builders rejected. When the builders go out and they're going to build the, build the temple up, they say, that stone's not good, this one's good. We need a cornerstone. Well, don't choose that one. Jesus is the chief cornerstone that the Father has chosen. Now, you can reject him, but let me say this. Should you reject Jesus, you're not done with him. You're not done with him. You're going to have to deal with this some point in time in your life or some point in time in eternity, but you're going to have to deal with him. Because you can't get around the fact that he is the creator of all things and all things are coming back to him, it says. They began with him, they operate through him, and they're all coming back and there's going to be a day when everything will stand before him and give an account to him. Why? Because God has raised him up and given him a name that the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that he is the Lord. He's precious in God's sight. So here we are. We are these, the priest of God so we need to be desirous, all right, of God's word. So if, as we're desirous of God's word, we can grow. And as we grow in this whole process, what are we doing? We're worshiping the Lord. So what's that make us? Well, it makes us, according to scripture, that worshipers are the ministers. We're the living stones. We're the ones that are here on the earth today to, to make a difference in the world that we live in. We're the ones here drawing attention and magnifying God and letting people know that God is alive and that Jesus is Lord and he's risen from the dead and he, he forgives men and saves men and changes people's lives. Who will come to him? He says, you're being built up as a spiritual house. We're, the, we're this refuge for the world, the church is. We're the place where people's lives can come. And I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about our lives. We are the living stones. And God has a purpose for us. That's why it says he's gifted us. We talked about last week. He gave you a gift. What for? To use in the body of Christ. He gave, he's made you part of something bigger than yourself. What is that? His family, his church, his bride. You're, you're part of that. He's made you a priest. So you know how to function in that particular role that he's called you to in your life. So realize that right now today as worshipers, that we're part of what God is doing. And you've got to see this. If you don't see this, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. part of what you've been called to do and what you've, been, what you've been made to be. You are part of this spiritual building. You are part of what God is up to. You're part of his living temple. Paul tells the church in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But then he goes on to say that we are all the temple together as well. We're individual temples. I gave my life to Christ. He lives in me now. But have to realize I'm now connected with all the other believers whom Christ lives in, and we're in this deal together. Let me say it again. We're in this deal together. Some of you got it. We're in this deal together. We're not isolated. We don't live that way. So we come to God. We're just sinners. We fall upon him. We cast ourselves upon him. We, play, we, 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 we accept his mercy. We receive his forgiveness, and he changes us and makes us pure. He makes us priests. He makes us ministers of his. Now we're part of what God's going on. So catch this. We are this living temple, and now we've been made to be a part of this living temple, and he's building upon Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. So we're always going to be coming to him. We're always going to be worshiping him. We're always going to be looking to him. We're always going to be trusting him to lead our lives, to direct our affairs, and to, to hold us into a place of accountability and mercy. This also means there's not a one of us that can live in isolation. This is a message the modern church in America does not get. We think we can go corporately worship and not be responsible for everybody else in that worship hall. But the Bible does not teach that. The Bible says that we need each other, that we're interrelated, we can't function without each other, that God's made us in such a way that we have to have each other. God, and he, Paul uses the illustration of your body. He says, you know, you can't separate the, the arm or the leg or the foot or the head from the body and expect it to function on its own. It won't do it rightly. It needs the rest of the body. I didn't make that up. I don't say that to get people to be more regular in church. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Word of God says. And I need to have a desire. If God said it, what am I doing with something different? 
Why am I living the way I'm living? Why am I trying to live as an island out here? My little world's all that's important. I'm going to do my own thing. You're going to miss life. And you're going to miss fullness. And you're going to miss the blessing of God that comes from being a spiritual living temple with other believers who are actively pursuing God in their life. The Bible uses the term church a lot in Scripture, but only two places in the New Testament where it talks about what we call a universal church. What's a universal church? Universal church is, you know, well, I'm a Christian. I'm out there with all the other Christians. We serve the Lord. Every other instance besides those two has to do with a local fellowship. The you and your own will and prayer and time with God decide this is where I'll be a part of. And then it tells in Scripture, whole books are dedicated to this in the New Testament, how it works, how it functions, how it's led, how it's directed, what it does, what its mission is, what its tasks are, who, who the people are, what their gifts are, and clearly identifies these people. And their offices and their places and their gifts and their abilities are all laid out in Scripture. What is it that we think we can just take two-thirds of the New Testament and throw it out and say the church is not important? The Bible says Jesus died for, what? for the church. Yeah, for you as an individual, but he wanted you to be a part of his bride, the church. And what's the church do? Well, we're all going to go to heaven. Eventually. <laughs> Amen. But what are we doing right now? We're just waiting for the Lord's return. Only what you're doing is just becoming sour and molded and old and crudgety and worthless. When the salt loses its savor, it's good for nothing. You say, I'm good for nothing? If you're losing your savor. I didn't write it. Don't get mad. He wrote it. <laughs> Amen? You know? And by the way, this ain't fake news. This is real news. This is the real story. I didn't make it up. God's word is what God's word says. So don't live out there and say, well, I'll just kind of church, not real important. I'll make it when I can make it. No, you need to find out where you're supposed to be and plug in. Get after it and do what God called you to do. We have to be available. We have to be surrendered. We have to be open to what God's telling us. But we have to be available to him and to each other. So that makes you responsible, how you live your life. I need to live a righteous life. Why? Because I don't want to have... I don't want to be the guy at the church. People say, I wouldn't go to that church because of the way they live. I don't want to be that guy. Do you want to be that guy? I mean, if you go ask the average person, why don't you go to church? And they'll tell you this. You'll let you finish this. Well, the church is just full of... Say that again. Even you know what the world says. Now, I, I will let you know. We've probably got a bunch of hypocrites in this room. I've been guilty of being a hypocrite. Amen? You don't say amen that. Please don't. <laughs> well, I've been guilty of being hypocrites. All right? But we don't want to be that once we know, once we've desired the word, now that we're growing, now that we see what that does, and we're making these choices, we're making right decisions, and we grow a little more, make the right choices, then the world's being effective in a positive manner. And then, guess what? I'm not casting a bad light on you. And you're not casting a bad light on me. And most importantly, we're not casting a bad light on the church and the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. If anybody will say anything about our churches, I mean, those people are real. They may be a little weird, but they're real. The Bible does say we'll be a peculiar people. I think we fit that bill. Some of y'all are real peculiar. Well, you got a pastor like that, all right? What are we saying? Let me just wrap this up and we'll finish. We should be as priests preparing in our ministry that we're in, constantly growing by desiring God's word and not just waiting for something to happen. No, this is what we're doing now. It's, you know, it's always amazing how God, you know, just it's all right. Yesterday, you were an adulterer. Yesterday, you were a fornicator. Yesterday, you were gay. Or yesterday, you were a drunk. Or yesterday, you were the most selfish person in the whole block. Yesterday, you know, you were, you, you were deep in pornography. Yesterday, you were the biggest liar in the state. Yesterday, okay, I come and give my life to Jesus. Okay, now I want you to go out and tell everybody what you've done. Excuse me, I just, you know what I am. No, that's what you were. That's what you were. I'm going to tell you what you are. Now you've been washed. Now you've been made clean. Now you're different. You say, well, 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 people won't believe it. It doesn't matter. You tell them anyway. And I'll tell you what. It'll catch up. It'll catch up. You keep walking it. You keep talking it. You keep living it. It'll catch up. They're going to say, oh, I guess that was right. That was real. He meant business. Hey, it's a great thing to be alive in Christ. It's a great thing to be alive in this generation in which we live because I believe this is probably the last generation as we know it. 
I believe that what we taught on prophecy is true because I believe the Bible is true. I, I believe we don't have that much longer before we see this great apocalypse that takes place. Where the, and the apocalypse is not zombies, all right? The apocalypse is the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Lord of all things when he splits the eastern sky and he's made manifest to the whole world. I believe we're not far from that day. I believe everything lines up ge geographically, lines up politically, lines up scripturally, lines up biblically. I don't think you can die what's happened in the world. It's already been prophesied thousands of years ago in the Bible. And not just a little here, a little there. It's all happening at one time now. Now we're seeing a, where before and past times, this would happen, that would happen, but Jesus must be coming. But this hadn't happened. And the biggest this that hadn't happened was the, the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Because that's the prophecy in which all prophecy hinges on in the New Testament. When that happens, you better get ready. Well, we've seen that in 1948. So what's that mean? That means we're probably pretty close to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that was the last big mark on the clock before the alarm sounds. These are good days. We ought to be excited about who? We ought to be excited about the Lord. We ought to be excited about each other. We ought to be forgiving one another. We ought to be moving past our petty differences. We ought to be saying, hey, you're weird, I'm weird, we'll live with that. Let's have a good time, praise the Lord, together. You know, you know. You're just, you know, you're not, you're not my bag of tea. Amen. But you're in the same box of flakes. <laughs> so let's get along. Let's see what God wants to do in our life. Let's enjoy what God's given us. Let's enjoy our church. Let's enjoy our fellowship. Let's enjoy the ministry that God's called us. And let's never be content with just coming to church and sitting on our behinds. Let's be the priest of the world God's called us to be. Let's stand together and pray.